This week's lecture is on expertise and experts. Uh, I've got two lectures. Uh, the first, we're going to define what it means to be an expert. Uh, and in, in the second lecture, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, expert thinking. So what's an expert? Uh, I've got this uh, uh, discussion, I think, in the textbook as well. Uh, this is a quote from Anders Ericsson, uh, who is a psychologist who studies expertise uh, and experts, uh, and suggests that there are uh, several criteria for uh, defining expertise. And one of the things to keep in mind uh, in this uh, lecture in general, uh, but particular with uh, Erickson's uh, discussion, is Erickson's discussing uh, what we would might we might consider to be elite experts. Uh, so people who are uh, recognized uh, as being the best at what they do. Uh, we're all pretty good at things, right? I mean, uh, I've been a uh, psychology professor for uh, 18 years or so, so I guess I'm pretty good at that. Uh, I've put a lot of hours uh, into uh, teaching uh, and doing research, but I'm not the best. Uh, I'm not an elite expert. Uh, most of you are probably pretty good at things, too. Maybe you've spent time uh, competitive athletics or uh, you've spent time uh, with uh, music or some other kind of skill, and you might be really good at it. Uh, or maybe you're really good uh, at being a university student. Uh, you're good at being a student. You put in uh, a number of years doing it. That means you're good at something, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're an elite uh, person or an expert. Maybe you are. Uh, but Erickson is talking about people who are sort of above and beyond. Uh, so these would be people that we would all look at and say, yes, this is an expert. Uh, so let's look at how he defines it. Real expertise must pass three tests. must lead to performance that, con that is consistently superior th to that of the expert's peers. So I've bolted that, consistently superior. Uh, so they're better not just once or twice, they're better most of the time. Uh, second, real expertise produces concrete results. Uh, so it's got to be something we can measure. Uh, brain surgeons, for example, uh, not only must be skillful with their scalpels, but must have successful outcomes with their patients. Uh, so in order to be an expert, you've got to be consistently superior. You also have to produce cons uh, concrete results. Uh, and then finally, true expertise can be replicated and measured in the lab. Uh, that one might be a little bit more controversial because not everything is easy to measure in the lab, but according to Erickson, we should be able to measure the components of expertise in the lab. Let's look at how e Erickson came uh, uh, came to think about expertise in this way. So here's a paper from 1993 that's quite a while ago, but this was a landmark paper in the study of expertise. Uh, and I'll go through several components of this uh, and talk about uh, how expertise develops. Uh, so this, uh, first of all, uh, Erickson introduces essentially three stages of development towards adult expertise. Let's assume that we're looking at people who are experts. The question is, how do they get there? Uh, and that's why this is titled uh, The Role of Deliberate Practice in the Acquisition of Expert Performance. Uh, so what Erickson and his colleagues are interested in is, if you are an expert, how do you get there? Uh, and in the three stages, uh, he suggests that people are introduced to areas they might uh, choose to excel in. Uh, you probably did this when you were younger. I imagine probably a lot of you uh, had parents that uh, you know enrolled you in soccer, uh, you know soccer teams. Uh, maybe you uh, played hockey for a while, or maybe you learned uh, to play the piano or play the violin, uh, or maybe you spent time in a theater camp, or uh, any one of a number of things. Uh, I think that's pretty common uh, for parents to uh, you know to have their kids do different kinds of activities. Uh, maybe you really like to. Uh, you know, to, to work on your own on some kind of expertise, maybe uh, whether it's some sort of hobby or collection or, uh, you know, computer programming or designing games, uh, video gaming, uh, any of these things you can get really good at. But what usually happens is that in childhood, uh, people are exposed to different things. They find something they like. Uh, and what he suggests is that's stage one. Stage two is the year at which practice is initiated. Uh, and here is where we define, and we're going to see in the next slide, uh, where experts deviate from non-experts. Uh, so someone who gets really good at doing something uh, might work at it for a few years, uh, might work at it for four or five years or even 10 years. 
uh, becomes good at it, but maybe they switch on to something else. Uh, you see this a lot in athletics, and I'll come back to this later uh, when we talk about different athletic uh, expertise, but you see this a lot in uh, youth sports and athletics. Many uh, kids uh, in grade school and high school end up playing competitive sports, elite sports, travel sports. Uh, maybe many of you did. Uh, my kids both uh, did this for a few years. Uh, it's fun for a little while when you're in, uh, you know, maybe when you're 12 or 13, but uh, after a while, most uh, kids find other interests. Even though they're still really good, maybe, at whatever that activity was, they may transition to something else after five or six years. So they don't lose the skill, but they don't transition to uh, expert performance. They take on other uh, activities. So they uh, stay in that stage two and never progress to the stage three, which is transition to full-time involvement. So this would be the difference between someone who was really good uh, at, uh, you know, played competitive hockey for a number of years and then gets a, a, a different job outside of playing hockey uh, and ends up being, uh, you know, still being a good hockey player, but not a professional hockey player. Whereas stage three, someone who's really good, uh, has the time, uh, puts in the hours, uh, and also has a little bit of luck, uh, can end up being a professional hockey player. Uh, who becomes a true expert. Uh, and Erickson uh, suggests that there are really three kinds of skills that we develop. Well, there's two kinds, but uh, he uh, divides them into three different uh, trajectories. Uh, the lowest level, which he calls everyday skills all of us uh, acquire. Uh, and these are meant to be things that are associative and autonomous. In other words, reading uh, and writing and navigating through the world, uh, basic skills that we all learn. Uh, we get really good at it, so good at it that it becomes automatic for most of us. Uh, so we don't put much thought into it. Uh, you don't necessarily put thought into getting better uh, at reading. Uh, maybe you don't put uh, much thought into getting better uh, at making coffee in the morning. These are things that you just put time in. You get better at them uh, so that they don't take up much of your, much of your day. These are everyday skills. Uh, and according to Erickson, uh, it's something that you should be able to become automatic at doing. So that's the bottom level. And then he suggests there are cognitive and associative skills. So things that require more effort, uh, more cognitive involvement. And these are the kind of things that we're going to uh, talk about in the next few slides as uh, expert skill. Uh, and his contention is that many people uh, start off on the same trajectory, getting really good at something, whether it's chess or uh, uh, soccer or piano uh, or any other kind of expert skill. Uh, when you give it up, you may enter this stage called uh, arrested development. So you stay good. Uh, you still have the skills. You never lose them, uh, but you're not really an expert. Uh, you're just good at it. Uh, you're not working to get better at it either. Uh, and probably a lot of us retain those skills, uh, things that maybe we learned when we were in uh, you know, elementary school or high school or even early in university uh, that we don't do very much anymore. We're not working to get better at it because we're working at other things. The skills aren't there. They're arrested development. Maybe you can come back to them, but you're not working to get better at them. It's only uh, the individuals who are able to put in the time uh, full-time to getting better that end up being experts. So how did Erickson arrive at this conclusion? Well, the only way to do this uh, is to sort of look at retrospective designs. In other words, you've got to find people who are already experts uh, or on the verge of becoming experts and then try to figure out how they got there. Uh, this does mean that you're sometimes looking at uh, correlations and trying to infer some causal mechanism. Uh, but with the development of expertise, there aren't a lot of other ways to do it. Uh, it's really not very easy to put people into an experimental design where you encourage some to become experts and some not to become experts. So we're always going to be looking backwards. We're going to have those uh, caveats to some of this research. But let's look at how they did this. So in this study, um, here's one of the first uh, landmark studies in this area. They looked at violinists. Uh, and these are people who are really good. So as you can see here, these are small sample sizes because these are a, an elite group of violinists. Uh, these are music professors at a music academy in West Berlin, uh, nominated violin students who had the potential for careers. So in other words, the people that are in this study 
are already really good because they're already attending a music academy and they were already nominated by their professors as being, or their instructors rather, uh, as being good violinists. Uh, so uh, they had 10 that they looked at. Uh, and these were called the best violinists. So in other words, they ask the instructors, who are the best people in your group? We've already got an elite group to begin with. Who are the best of the best? And let's pick these 10, and let's call them, in quotes, the best violinists. Music professors also nominate a large number of good violinists from the same department. Uh, so, you know, professors saying, here's our, here's our top 10 uh, uh, students. These are the people who are the best in our uh, school right now. And they agreed. Uh, and... Here are some people who are really good, and of course they're going to be good because they're already at an elite music academy. So these are not, uh, you know, these are not low quality violinists. They're just not the best of the best violinists. Uh, so they selected ten from that group, uh, and then they selected ten from a group that were doing music education. Uh, music education in this particular academy uh, would have meant less time uh, spent. On, uh, performing, on performance and more time spent on learning how to teach the instrument, which means that they don't have as much time to practice just getting better at playing. That doesn't mean they're no good. It just means that they're looking to teach rather than perform. So they put their time in different areas. Uh, yes, they're still good violinists, uh, but they don't put time into just being good violinists. They have to put time into being good teachers as well. Uh, and then uh, they also interviewed 10 middle-aged violinists who belonged to two symphony or orchestras uh, in uh, Berlin. So these are really good professional violinists, people who have already achieved that level of expertise. And if anybody, I don't know if any of you play the violin, I don't, um, but if you know anything at all about playing the violin, uh, it's going to take a long time to get there, right? Uh, and certainly if you follow uh, you know, the world of classical music and symphony orchestras, it's not easy to get there. Uh, so by virtue of just being in a professional symphony orchestra, you're already uh, an elite performer uh, among your peers. Uh, these are not easy uh, positions to get. It takes a long time and a lot of work uh, to get there. So, And of course, this is uh, symphony orchestras in Germany where this is already sort of a high level uh, of achievement. Uh, so these are probably some of the best violinists in the world uh, that are considered to be the professionals. And they ask them a lot of questions about how they got to be there. Uh, here's, two, here's just two examples, figure eight and figure nine from their paper on the top, figure eight. Uh, you can see the estimated amount of time for practice alone. So this is just practicing with the violin as a function of age uh, for all the different groups. And you can see that for the professionals, which are the triangles, uh, they estimated uh, that, you know, by age 10, they were putting in uh, 10 hours a week, and this continued to improve. So these are weekly practice in hours, so that by the time they were 20, they were putting in a full-time job almost, 30 hours or more per week just playing the violin and trying to get better. Uh, and this is practice. This isn't just playing for performance. This is practice. This is working on trying to be a better violin player. Uh, and you can see that this trajectory, so this is them remembering back how many hours uh, and to, that I used to put in, it tracks really well with what the best students do. So you can see the squares there. Uh, these are people who are currently this age, uh, and they're also putting in this uh, somewhere between 25 and 30 hours by the time they're in their 20s. Uh, so again, they're putting in almost a full-time job practicing the violin. Uh, the good students are also in that range, but not quite as much. And the uh, people who are destined to become music teachers, much less. Uh, so they're putting in only about 10 hours a week at age 20, uh, just practicing the violin, which is understandable because they're choosing a different career. Uh, so they need to put time into other things as well. Uh, and you can see that when they looked back, so this is weekly performance, figure nine shows accumulated hours. What they determined was that the best violinists and the professionals, by the time they were age 20, had accumulated approximately 10,000 hours of practice, uh, what they call dedicated practice, practice trying to get better. Uh, and that this was not as much for the good violinists. So by age 20, the good violinists were only putting in around 8,000, 7 to 8,000 hours. So they were lagging behind. They just weren't playing as much. Uh, they weren't as good, and they, weren't, they didn't put as many hours as. And that's a correlation, right? But uh, there is some 
uh, suggestion that there's this connection between the two things. Putting in the amount of time allows you to uh, you know, be a better performer. And the, cl- clearly the, prof- uh, the uh, teachers are putting in many fewer hours because they're putting in hours on other skills. Uh, this replicates with other kinds of uh, uh, with other kinds of skills. So they also looked at pianists, uh, for example. So piano players uh, showed the same trajectory: experts versus amateurs. What they also found was that they estimated uh, these people uh, that they asked uh, to estimate how many, you know, how often did you practice each week. Uh, turns out that by age 20, they had put in about 10,000 hours of practice. So they found this across lots of domains, this idea that by the time they were considered good professional experts, they had put in about 10,000 hours of practice. Finally, for a meta-analysis, looking at lots of different other studies that have examined expertise across different domains, uh, they noted that even though in some of these cases the uh, Uh, methodologies differed, Uh, they found some interesting patterns that suggested the same thing. So in this case, uh, they were looking at music, violin and piano, chess, uh, different kinds of sports, gymnastics, running, tennis, and swimming. These are all things that require a lot of dedicated practice. There are other things to be an expert in. Of course, you know, we can talk about expert physicians and doctors, uh, experts uh, in engineering, experts in investment, Uh, And these are things that maybe people develop their expertise in later on. Or these might be things that, uh, for example, if you're uh, an expert at uh, making money, you're an expert investor, uh, there are lots of skills that you need to bring to bear. You've got to be able to have uh, computational expertise. You've got to be able to have expertise reading uh, different kinds of reports. You've got to possibly be very good at uh, computer programming and so on. So maybe lots of other skills are brought together. These are types of expertise for which a lot of focus needs to be made on the one skill. So violin, uh, chess, uh, different kinds of sports like gymnastics, where you have to keep working on routines. When people are at this elite level, they tend to be in their uh, teens or even in their sometimes in their low 20s. And what they found is that across these different studies, uh, people were getting into these sports uh, at these uh, various levels of expertise uh, fairly young ages. Uh, So at these highest levels, the ages that you begin tend to be a little bit younger, meaning that you've had more time to achieve this uh, 10,000 hours of practice before you get to that level. And so what this did, uh, what this kind of work did, is that it Uh, sort of gelled together on this idea of 10 years or 10,000 hours. And this seems to be uh, what's uh, called, well, it's what we now call the 10,000 hour rule. So this idea, 10 years, 10,000 hours, and 10 years, by the way, is sort of analogous to 10,000 hours. That means you've been putting in a certain number of hours uh, over a 10 year span. Uh, This had been observed early on with uh, Herb Simon, Uh, looking at expertise in chess. And they found that chess experts take about 10 years of intense preparation uh, to reach this exceptional levels. And this doesn't mean that you can't be a really good junior chess player. It just means that in order to get sort of grand master level, you really have to have been playing for about 10 years uh, in order to get there. Uh, And Erickson, of course, found that uh, the number of years can vary, but it seems to maybe be the number of hours Uh, So they referred to this varyingly as the 10-year rule or the 10,000-hour rule, uh, suggesting that for lots of different domains, especially if the domain requires a lot of dedicated practice to get good, uh, this this idea that you put in 10,000 hours to get there uh, seems to emerge. Uh, It's well known enough that uh, it's become sort of a, it's, it's, you know, it's entered into popular consciousness. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, who is a, uh, an author who writes a lot about uh, expertise and a lot about psychology uh, and looking at trends, uh, suggests that you know, this trend emerges for a lot of different people. Uh, people, uh, for example, he focuses on a book that he wrote in uh, 2008 uh, on people who, are, uh, who, who sort of became uh, true uh, leaders uh, in their chosen field. Uh, people like Bill Gates or uh, the Beatles, for example. Uh, And what he noticed is that they also seem to have this 10,000 hours. And what he also pointed out, now he writes, 10,000 hours is the magic number of greatness. I'll come back to this idea. It doesn't 
really seem to be a magic number of greatness. But uh, what he found was that these particular individuals, individuals like Bill Gates, for example, uh, had things happen around them. So they were lucky in ways that allowed them to accumulate these 10,000 hours earlier than some of their peers might have, just by virtue of circumstance or the way in which they're uh, you know, being in the right time and the right place, gave them the opportunity to accumulate these 10,000 hours, which allowed them to then uh, sort of uh, rise to a very high level of expertise. So I say here it might not be true. Uh, and by might not be true, I don't mean that Erickson's research is wrong. Erickson's research suggests that when you look back uh, at people who, you know, when you look at people who are already experts and then you look back at them, it looks as if they've achieved 10,000 hours. But Erickson was very clear about this. Uh, there is no magic number. Uh, he says uh, the belief that a sufficient amount of experience or practice leads to maximal performance appears incorrect. So when you look back, uh, it does look like there's about 10,000 hours uh, that these experts have put in, but uh, it's not a it's not a magic number. He also writes, there's no firm theoretical mechanism associated with this 10-year rule. Uh, so this idea of 10,000 hours or 10 years, it's definitely associated with expertise, but it's not the only thing that matters. Uh, it's not a guarantee. You could easily put in 10 years of experience and enter the arrested development stage, for example. You could spend 10 years doing something, but not 10 years trying to get better at it, uh, and you'll be good, uh, but you may not be the elite expert. This is the point in the final two slides that I want to bring up uh, that some meta-analyses have tried to show. Uh, so there have been several studies, uh, mostly led uh, by a psychologist uh, at uh, Case Western Reserve uh, University now, uh, Brooke McNamara, uh, where she's looked at a lot of other studies. Uh, so the whole field of expertise uh, has been looking at whether or not this idea of 10,000 hours or dedicated practice or deliberate practice is required for expertise. And what she's found uh, is that it's important, but it's relatively more important for some domains than it is for others. So this particular plot here, for example, shows that across many different studies, uh, the light, uh, so these, are different, these, plot, these pie charts here, the light sliver, uh, so the lighter gray, shows the proportion of variance explained by deliberate practice. In other words, the greater that light gray uh, pie slice, the more performance is defined or uh, accounted for by the amount of hours. So for games and music and sports, for example, uh, it's, it's about a quarter or a fifth of the performance is explained by deliberate practice. Uh, so if you're a chess player, uh, that's still a really important aspect of your game. If you're a musician, that's a really important aspect of your skill. And if you play a sport, that's a really important aspect uh, of your sport. You've got to put in that time. But still, clearly, uh, somewhere between 75% and 80% of the variance is explained by something else, uh, which could be things like physiological uh, variables. So in sports, uh, there are things about your physiology which are going to enable you to be better or faster or more nimble than other competitors. Uh, and these are things that may not have anything to do with deliberate practice, but deliberate practice will improve. Uh, but you may always have a uh, a bit of a leg up if you have a certain physiology. This might also be true for music. You may have access to, uh, you know, a, a better teacher, uh, which is not necessarily going to translate into, uh, you know, it won't be accounted for by the number of hours. Two different people can have a different teacher. Uh, 10,000 hours with one teacher might be uh, better than 10,000 hours with another teacher. So there are lots of other things, and that's all, that's the point she's trying to make. It isn't just deliberate practice, that there are other things too. Uh, and these things uh, for things like education and professions, so physicians, for example, explains much less uh, for professional expertise. Uh, and in this case, we're talking about doctors or uh, engineers, people whose expertise is connected to a formal training. Uh, most of it has to do with other things. It doesn't seem to be uh, the amount of hours. And in retrospect, this kind of what well, kind of makes sense, right? You can imagine expert physicians or expert surgeons, uh, they all go through the same training, right? I mean, you have to put in a certain number of training hours to become a, uh, an attending physician. And so for medical expertise, uh, 
you know, the, the amount of hours you put in is probably, it's important, but it's probably much less important than for some of these other things. And that's because everyone has to put in a certain number of hours in med school, in residency, in fellowship, uh, hours in uh, the hospital, and so on. Uh, she also finds, though, that um, for elite samples, uh, and this is the final graph that I have here, she looked at sports separately, uh, and this this sort of reinforces the idea that there are uh, aspects of expertise which don't uh, require uh, this deliberate practice. What she found is that for elite samples, in other words, the very best of the best, uh, these would be the, the Usain Bolt uh, type uh, people, uh, you know, people who are truly at the very highest uh, level, uh, Olympic level, uh, gold medal level uh, athletes. Uh, the amount of time spent seems to have very little to do with uh, achieving that expertise. It's almost always uh, something else, uh, whether it's uh, access to a really good coach or a coaching facility, uh, support by the uh, team or the country, uh, or physiology. There's usually something else uh, that's going to give you, uh, that's going to account for expertise at that highest level. And again, just like in the previous example when I suggested that physicians uh, or doctors or professional people might show less variance accounted for by the amount of practice just by virtue of how we train people, uh, this is going to be true too for uh, you know Olympic level athletes. Everyone is putting in lots of hours. They've all put in over 10,000 hours to get there. Uh, so it makes sense that they wouldn't that wouldn't be a very good predictor. If everyone who's competing in the Olympics uh, has put in you know, 10, 12,000 hours trying to get good, uh, then that's, there's not much variability there. Uh, that's not going to predict uh, the range of performance. It's going to be something else. Uh, so the percentage of variance explained by the elite experts seems to be much lower. So looking at uh, this uh, entire picture, we've got the idea that in order to achieve a high level of expertise, there's some expectation that you've got to put time in. Uh, and this doesn't undermine that, right? She's not suggesting that uh, the elite people did not put in 10,000 hours. All she's saying is that they've all put in 10,000 hours and something else accounts for their expertise. So 10,000 hours does seem to be uh, correlated uh, or consistent with the idea of uh, development of expertise, but it's not the only thing. Uh, so that's it for this uh uh, for this lecture. I've got a second lecture now where we'll talk about expert thinking. Sometimes we'll talk about these kinds of elite experts. Other times I'll talk about people who are just really good uh, at doing things. Uh, but I want to talk about some of the cognitive uh, advantages that come with expertise.